Um, and I think that's probably enough of the parish notices. Uh, and we'll switch to tonight's uh, event, which is a lecture which is coming to us from Anne Copley, who's here. Um, and Anne uh, started out as a research in TV world and then became a grown-up lawyer. She did for many, many years. Um, and then, then I think she probably retired and just spent the last several years researching and writing an extraordinary book, uh, which we'll, she's talking about tonight, uh, The Girl with a Peach. Um, and divides her, t her time between the UK and her home in Le Marque. And she's just driven down from Le Marque today. And it was in Le Marque that she first started exploring uh, the story she'd heard younger from her uncle about how the young POWs were looked after by the Contadini when they walked out of the camps when the armistice happened in 1943. I think that's broadly it. And then there's a, a little coda at the end, and we'll pass over to her colleague, uh, Ian, who's with us also. Um, and Ian... Uh, with Anne is involved in the Mont Saint Martin Trust. And that is a, um, a voluntary organization which raises money for two purposes. One is that they uh, are doing a lot of research and publication around this extraordinary story of how the Contadini looked after the, the wandering lost young men from the, the Allied forces. Um, and also they have, they've raised money to offer scholarships to young Italians from the parts of Italy where, where this was happening as a way over time to say thank you. Um, and the Montsamon Trust, Trust had teamed up with the British Institute to offer, I think, six scholarships we have for people based in the Florence area. So um, that's a really great contribution that they're making. So um, uh, good friends and partners with a great story to tell. So Anne, over to you. <clears throat> oh, good. I am working. Thank you very much for the grown-up lawyer. Not sure that I am grown-up even yet, but um, <clears throat> good to say. And yes, I am a trustee along with Ian of the Monte San Martino Trust, um, which I can tell you all about later, um, should you wish. But uh, for now, on with the talk. This is really a history talk, more than anything else. However, given that this is Florence, I felt I had to inject a bit of art into it. So we start with this, which should you ever come over to my neck of the woods, uh, I suggest that you go to Ascoli Piceno, a city which claims to have the most beautiful um, piazza in Italy, one of many, no doubt. Um, uh, and in the crypt of the cathedral there is a series of mosaics of which this is one. They're called Charity in the Mountains, and they were um, commissioned by the Bishop of, uh, of um, Ascoli Piceno, who was called Ambrogio Squintai, uh, from a Genovese artist called Pietro Guandensi, uh, I think it is, I can't read my own writing. Um, uh, and he, so, the, so Pietro um, designed it, and the mosaics were then made in the Vatican studio in 1954. And they are now in the crypt of the um, of the uh, uh, cathedral in Ascoli Piceno. And as you can see, this one very much is about what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, it is people, both uh, uh, priests and uh, monks, and the local people helping Allied uh, POWs and escapers. You'll, obviously, you can see the chap down there still wearing a bit of um, uniform, which was fairly unusual by the time they'd escape that they had practically nothing to wear and anyway they needed to get rid of it pretty quickly because they made them too obvious. Um, I'm interested particularly in this guy here. He's obviously um, darker skinned. There were of course a lot of black South Africans and black Americans and Indians, all escapers um, <clears throat> who were looked after as well uh, and various others behind him. I particularly love because I've done a whole study of the ladies with things on their heads uh, which I didn't realize was very much an Italian thing up until, well, post-war anyway. Um, so this really encompasses the theme of my talk, which is the courage and compassion, as I say, um, uh, uh, shown to very surprised Allied uh, escapers once they'd left, left um, their camps. Now, let me see if I'm going to work properly. Yes. So where did these people come from in the first place? That were these people who really... So it kind of fell out of the, well, it might have well have come from another planet as far as the people, the Contadini and others who ended up looking after them. Well, this, these are prisoners of the Indian army taken at the fall of Tobruk. 
something like 32,000 prisoners were taken at the fall of Tobruk, um, all of whom the deal was when Germany kind of took charge in the North African campaign, because Italy was nearly wiped out at the very beginning, uh, the deal was that um, any prisoners that were taken would be handed over to the Italians. And there's lots of stories from the prisoners themselves of Germans taking them prisoner and then apologizing profusely that they had to be handed over to the Italians. <laughs> so uh, they were handed over to the Italians, sometimes in contravention of uh, the G Geneva Convention, they were put to work a, 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 as war work, um, for, usually by the Germans rather than the Italians. If they weren't, they were marched through the desert. Remember, these are battle-weary men, um, marched through burning sand, may, uh, sometimes on the back of trucks, uh, through transit, transit camps in North Africa, um, where they were starving, there was no water, dysentery was rife, uh, many people died in basically barbed wire compounds, just barbed wire in the sand. Um, uh, so it was a pretty dire time. The officers were separated out. And although, of course, uh, people, uh, the officers, it's not nice for anybody to be a POW, um, certainly the officers had a slightly better time of it. They tended, on the whole, to be flown from Africa over to Italy or sometimes put in ships, but nothing like what happened to these guys, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll come to in a minute. As you can imagine, the, uh, the opportunity to escape was pretty, at this stage, was pretty um, negligible. You're in the middle of the desert. You're probably a 1,000 miles from, from the Allied lines, um, and uh, you stood out like a sore thumb. However, partly because it's such a wonderful painting, I wanted to introduce you to this chap, He's called Job Maseko. That painting is by a South African artist called Neville uh, Lewis. Uh, he, is, uh, he, he was a war artist, obviously, during the war. Painted a lot of black South Africans. Uh, painted uh, Montgomery three times, apparently. Um, and Job uh, is an amazing character. He did escape and walked for something like 18 days back to the Allied lines through the desert stealing water on the way from German and Italian encampments. So, you know, and, uh, having to do that secretly, obviously. Um, uh, but even more amazing than his escape was the fact that prior to his escape, he had sabotaged and sunk a boat, a, a supply ship of the, uh, that the Germans were using because black in um, Africa, well, he was from the what's called the Native Military Corps, which were, he was South African, um, uh, black South Africans were in the native military corps, uh, and they were considered by the Germans not to be covered by the Geneva Convention at all. So he and his colleagues were working down at the docks, um, unloading the ships. He didn't like the way he was being treated, uh, and so he uh, um, got hold of a um, condensed milk can, filled it with the rem remnants, there are lots of bullets lying around, so he just filled it with cordite from the bullets, put a very long fuse on it, um, uh, lit one end as they were leaving the boat, having finished their work for the day. Uh, and as they came, walked back to their camp, there was a massive explosion and the ship was gone. I think it's interesting to point out that nobody um, thought that this could possibly be these uh, people who, according to the Germans, of course, they were kind of like an under underclass, an under race. Um, so they couldn't possibly have the initiative to do that. So the local German guards got blamed for smoking while on duty. Uh, Job um, was, according to Neville Lewis, Job was, uh, um, it was suggested that he should get the Victoria Cross for what he did. However, apparently somebody said that he's only an African, so he doesn't get that. Uh, and sadly, he, when he got back to Africa, he didn't live for very much longer. He was finally run over by a train. But I just think that is the most wonderful portrait. So well, those who didn't escape were shipped over to Italy. Uh, as I say, the officers on the whole were, were flown over. And there's quite a lot of talk amongst the officers of plans whilst on the plane to hijack the plane, then realizing none of them knew how to fly it. Um, <clears throat> Um, uh, so none that didn't work. I think one lot who were pilots anyway managed to get hijack the plane and take it to Malta. But otherwise, the officers were flown over or they were taken over in sort of, you know, um, light, um, light 
boats, or not a, or whatever you call them, whereas the um, POW, the, the men, the other ranks, were taken over where they were put in the holds of cargo ships. Uh, and I'll leave it to your imagination a little bit, but I'll just help along by saying that, um, as you can imagine, these people already had dysentery. They were very seasick. They were there was nowhere to go to the loo, um, uh, and uh, so there are some pretty gross descriptions of what it was like sitting in the bottom of the hold as the ship went from side to side with everything slopping all over the place. Uh, that lasted for about three days. Even worse than that was the fear that you were going to be torpedoed by your own side, and that did happen several times. One, but one ship that was sunk. Uh, it was so, uh, there were something like 840 POWs on board, only about 25 of them survived. And this was such a horrible um, a scandal that it was hushed up for many, many years until various historians and the families themselves managed to bring it to light. So there, there, there they went uh, from uh, North Africa to various transit camps um, around the south of Italy. And then they would go on to what was more or less their final camp, although they still used to get moved around a bit. And so these are the prison camps that were set up in Italy. Now, if you remember, I just said that in, uh, in Tobruk, 32,000 prisoners were taken. Italy had no idea how to cope with that number. Um, and, uh, and so they were um, housed in extraordinarily, um, extraordinary uh, different ways. Uh, old um, factories were, requisite, were requisitioned, um, old World War I camps were brought back into service, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, again, the officer had a slightly better time of it. Now you'll see up here that um, I've got uh, the camps that were in Tuscany highlighted. So number 202, if I can just... Number 202, that's in Luca. And in fact, it was more of a hospital than a camp. Uh, and the people there were mostly POWs from um, Camp PG, it was called, Prigionieri, uh, Camp of Prigionieri. Um, uh, they were most, uh, the 202, the hospital, mostly took people from uh, Camp 60, which was actually so bad that the Red Cross inspectors who came to look at it uh, um, condemned it and it was closed down. It was a basically tents on a swamp. Everybody had malaria, um, uh, and it was closed down. Reopened again later because you know they had more people that they had to house somewhere. So that was that's a hospital in Luca. This is the Top Brasses prison. Doesn't look much like a prison. It's in um, Vinci. Oh, how do you pronounce it? How much? Vinci Liata, Yes. Um, uh, and the Red Cross report there, compared to the one on PG-60, reads kind of like a TripAdvisor, um, <laughs> a five-star TripAdvisor report um, on uh, you know, the nice walks that the generals could take and how they had their own rooms and they could um, uh, play various games. And I think they com complained that they didn't have enough you know, variety of food or something, but other than that, um, uh, it was, you know, compared to what I'm going to show you in a minute, it was it was not bad at all. Um, I think it was a wedding venue, and I think it may be for sale now, um, Vinci Liata. Last time I looked, it was anyway. Um, uh, and this is fairly common for officers. They were housed in places like this, um, castles, uh, um, mon old monasteries, one down in, um, down in the south. Padula was described as the most beautiful prison camp in Europe. And it was, it was the most fabulous um, uh, monastery. Um, uh, and this one is uh, near, where is it, near Poppy. Uh, and again, this is a, an old um, Capuchin monastery. Uh, uh, that's PG 38. Uh, and that also housed officers. I think it was meant to house New Zealand and uh, Australian officers. They're supposed to be separated out by nationality. Um, and there's a wonderful quote from somebody who, when they first arrived, saying, the commander greeted us as if we were his guests. In the mess hall, the tables were set with white tablecloths and brand new cutlery. <laughs> so, you know, no wonder a lot of them didn't want to bother escaping. 
Now, our hero, whose book this is here, um, Frank, he is one of the other ranks, and this is what his camp looked like. Not quite the same at all. Not only that, but when he arrived, those huts did not exist. He, they, it was a, a greenfield site, and they had to build their own, well, they lived in tents, and they had to build their own accommodation. And Frank apparently was in hut 11, so he had to wait for numbers 1 to 10 to be built before he had anything other than a, a tent to stay in. Uh, well, everything from 1940 to 1943. This is what they, uh, some of the camps looked like inside. This is actually PG Schwarzai Costa, which is over in Lamarque, my neck of the woods. This is by an artist called Paul Bullard, who was a POW over there. Um, and this is one of those requisition factories I mentioned. Uh, uh, and you can see three tier bunks, very close together. Apparently the best bunks were the top bunks because you could talk to people all around you and you had a bit of light so you could read later. Next best was the bottom bunk because you could sit on the floor and play cards with your mates. Four old sods in the uh, middle bunk didn't, you know, they had to beg to be allowed to come and sit down on the bottom. So the middle bunk was not the one to have. And to give you some idea of the overcrowding, um, there, there's another sketch by Paul Bullard showing the same thing. Uh, these camps, Swartz Acosta in particular, during the winter of 1942, people were dying of starvation or starvation-related diseases at the rate of about eight to ten a week. Uh, um, uh, they, they, they were so hungry, partly because the Red Cross, because of all the influx, particularly after the fall of the brook in June 42, they were so hungry um, uh, because the Red Cross didn't know where they were. The Red Cross took quite a long time to work out where all these new prison camps were. Um, so they were living on what they call skilly, which is basically a big barrel where a few bits of cabbage thrown in uh, were, and then filled up with water. Uh, and um, it was very important that whoever was brought out this barrel, feed everybody, kept stirring it up. Because otherwise, all the goodies, if you can call it that, fell to the bottom. Uh, and the people who had the last dibs got the best best of it. Norman Davison, who was um, in one of the other camps in, uh, in uh, Le Marque, talks about the fact that he stopped trying to tie up his shoelaces because bending down would bring on a blackout because he was so hungry. So you can imagine, uh, you can imagine how bad it was. Um, particularly during the winter of 1942. By spring 43, things were getting a little bit better. The weather got better for a start. Um, Red Cross parcels started to arrive more regularly. There was better war news. Um, the war, war in the North African campaign was finally won by the Allies. Um, and there were escape attempts made mostly. They were unsuccessful, but there were a few ingenious ones, which you can read in my book. Um, Frank here, this guy, Frank, who's our hero, um, uh, he uh, actually made an exploratory escape to see if it was possible and then came back. I have no idea why. Um, uh, and he was then involved in a grand tunneling um, uh, uh, enterprise, uh, which was actually overtaken by events, so the tunnel was never used. But tunneling wasn't just um, in, you know, like the Great Escape. Uh, there were tunnels dug in practically every prison camp, as far as I can understand. So Villano, which is close to where I live, there were three tunnels built. The third one, uh, a lot of people would have got out through, except that a rather corpulent petty officer got stuck. And so they, um, so that, that, they wouldn't have succeeded anyway, because they were going out into the middle of the countryside, which was enemy territory. Uh, and the ones who did get out were invariably caught and brought back. However, that all changed in September 1943, which was when Italy uh, signed an armistice with the Allies. And as you can see here, as far as the Italians were concerned, that was it. The war was over. For, for, uh, uh, and there was great um, joy and, uh, 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 and celebrating. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that that was pretty short-lived because, for instance, Florence was not liberated until August 1944, so a whole year later. Um, uh, there was something called a stay-put order, 
uh, which uh, came from London and was told the prisoners to stay where they were because the idea was the Allies were going to sweep up through Italy, pick up all the prisoners on the way and didn't want them getting in the way and, and souring relations with the locals in the meantime. Very optimistic and that's not what happened. So uh, quite a few people said, good, we'll, we'll just sit and wait. But 50,000, 50,000 of these 80,000 POWs who there were in camps all over Italy, 50,000 of them did escape into the countryside. Now, at least half of them were rounded up pretty quickly for a variety of reasons. They'd go striding off down the, down the road, looking like a soldier, and very quickly got picked up because, of course, there were Italian fascists around. There were also the beginnings of Germans who arrived within three or four days um, to take over the camps. Also, uh, they would go into a local bar and get completely out of their heads um, uh, because they hadn't had any drink for years and years and years, and then they'd be picked up drunk. Uh, so about 25,000 of them were collected fairly quickly, but that left 25,000. 25,000 um, uh, of these young men roaming the countryside, not knowing what to do or where to go. And one of them was our hero, Frank, who was in, sorry, I, I didn't tell you the name of his camp. His camp was Laterina. There it is, there's a picture of it at the bottom of his book there. Um, and uh, as I say, he was a serial escaper. I thoroughly recommend his book. It's available on, um, on Amazon. Uh, and um, he, is, he, he, he left. Because of the stay put order, some, some uh, um, leaders of the camp uh, replaced the Italian guards who all just basically melted away saying, hooray, the war's over, we're going home, um, uh, and replaced them with their own guards. And Frank, in his book, describes leaving the camp, being told by one of these guards, you, you're not supposed to be going, and you can imagine the response. <laughs> Um, so uh, I don't I, I don't think they they would have shook their own side anyway. But anyway, uh, Frank uh, gave gave them as good as as good as they got. As I say, the Germans very quickly arrived, uh, and this is uh, an example of um, a a poster that was put up everywhere. This one comes from Servigliano, basically warning anybody any Italian who helped in any way a prison an escape prisoner of war. That firstly, they would be uh, they would be shot, um, or if they informed, they would um, they would have a have a reward. And actually, rather horribly, because a lot of Italians, of course, were prisoners of war all over the place. And by this stage, prisoners of the Germans, because the Germans, because they changed sides. Um, and quite often, people were told, if you uh, inform, uh, we will make sure that you can get your son or your brother back from back from wherever he is. So. The extraordinary thing is, this didn't seem to have any effect. That um, uh, people, these these escapers, came across. You couldn't avoid them. Italy was fifty percent agrarian at the time. Um, every you couldn't walk down the road without bumping into an Italian. Quite who quite often said, "Oh, are you English? Oh, come home with me. My the, my neighbours have already got one of you, and you know we'd quite like to have one too." Um, uh, and in fact, the more exotic you were, I'm bearing in mind, we're talking about Simpadini people who had never been more than a few kilometers from their, from their homestead. Uh, so these, were, these people dropping out of the sky after years of propaganda about how the English all lived in palaces and had five meals a day. Uh, it were, they were just completely fascinated uh, and also very excited uh, and, and also had no real allegiance to any political organization. So this is the village of Monte Benuti, up near Arezzo, and this is where Frank was looked after for about six months. Um, it's, as you can see, is up on a hill, um, and I've, I've put drawn in there, you can see where it is. So he, he would, he would um, go between Monte Benuti and Pietra Viva, and soon, it, but you had to make sure that you stayed within your little area and you stayed um, uh, as isolated as possible. Frank tells a story of going down into the village of Ambra there. This is the Val Ambra. Um, uh, and he, he was going to go and watch a movie. Uh, the cinema was closed, so they went into a bar. They were obviously extremely unwelcome. 
and eventually they hightailed it back to Montebaniki, where he was very seriously killed off by the people of Montebaniki, and in fact was almost um, banished from the banished from the village um, because he was putting them all in danger. So the more isolated you could be, the better. And these are the sort of people who were looking after our, our people. This is a family of a Contadino family from uh, the Marque region, which is, I think, even more impoverished than over here. But um, you can see from from this photograph, I'll, which I'll tell you a little bit about. You can see, you know, no, a lot of them are barefoot. If they're not barefoot, they have um, the homemade clogs. Apart from the lady, the lady over here, who's obviously got her best Sunday shoes on. This lady here. Um, uh, they were illiterate. They were impoverished. Uh, they were despised by the rest of society. In the town near me called Amandala, up until the 1960s, the Contadini were not allowed into the piazza. Not, there was no bylaw, it was just understood that they were not allowed into, they didn't come into the piazza. Um, but these were the people who took in, on the whole, most of the uh, escapers. Now, the, of course, these people were illiterate, um, and so there's very few first-hand accounts of what it was like, what the life of a contadino was like. I will recommend to you two books. One is this, if you are Italian speakers, it's called Il Vergaro. The Vergaro was the head man. Um, there could be up to 30 people living in in this house, in a house together or um, working together, and the Vergara was the spokesman for all of them. This guy, um, uh, Renato Pigliacampo, he started life as a in a contadino family, ended up as an academic, and he gives wonderful stories. Well, he, he writes wonderfully about the life of a contadino and how despised they were. This one, I'm not sure, is on Amazon. It's I don't and I don't know whether over here you've heard of the wine choo choo was very famous over in the market. And in fact, my husband even found it in Bogota, Colombia. Um, uh, this guy also, um, Natalino Bartolome, started as a contadino and is now a major wine producer. This book is in Italian and has been translated into English. And again, Natalino talks about um, the fact that what it was like growing up just after the war. The, the system of sharecropping, which is what this was, the mezzadria, as it was called, um, uh, went on until the 1980s. It finally died out in the 1980s. So there's a lot of memories um, about what it was like. And as I say, they were despised. They had to give the half of everything that they um, that they grew to their padrone, to the, the landowner, who could throw them out without any reason, on a whim. Uh, altogether, it was a very, very hard life. Um, and certainly that's what uh, the prisoners the escapers thought. Um, they uh, they talk about finding themselves back living in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, and Ray Ellis, uh, one of the people in my book, uh, talks about living in his history books. It was like going back 500 years or more. Um, these photographs, just in passing, were found by my friend Giordano Viozzi when he was clearing out his um, aunt's house after she died. We don't know who they are. We know who some of them might be because um, they're Giordano's relatives. On the whole, we don't know who they are. We don't know who took them, but they are the most fantastic collection. They're, they're going to be exhibited in um, Monte San Martino shortly, and I'm hoping to arrange at least one exhibition in the UK because I mean, this is just a tiny selection of really beautiful, beautiful photographs of the Contadini, who are normally in photographs, um, are kind of the bucolic addition in the background of a, of a beautiful landscape. So, as I say, um, in amongst all of this, people were working, obviously, you can see, and some of the prisoners didn't work. They decided they'd done their bit and they just sat around and drunk all day um, and ate. Uh, Frank in his book talks about the drunk miller who loved the British because they saved him in the First World War and said he was going to become, stay intoxicated until the Allies arrived. And he was housing six prisoners 
um, all of whom were also fairly intoxicated most of the time, did no work. Others worked very hard. Ray Ellis, again in my book, um, talks about how appallingly, he, he, how difficult he found really from dawn till dusk and beyond, working the fields, looking after the oxen, all the rest of it, and a, a lot of other, uh, 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 one of the other prisoners um, uh, that I refer to, Len Dan, uh, is kind of compares it, he was writing in the 1960s, and he compares it to trade unionists at the time, and they would, they don't know their ball compared to what it was like working as a contadina. Uh, of course, there was fraternization with women, although um, <clears throat> for the women, and as I said, there's all this propaganda about wealth and all the rest of it, um, and, and a lot of the young men had, had scarpered for a variety of reasons, mainly because if they were rounded up by the Germans, they'd be taken off for forced labour. Uh, so there weren't any young men around. Plus, there were the only young men around looked like really good prospects. Uh, so there was a lot of fraternisation. Len decided early on he wasn't going to be part of that because um, some girl uh, came on to him quite strong, and Len watched his father looking up at the rifle that was just above his door and thought, mm, maybe not. Uh, and uh, not. Uh, Later on, he was walking with the mother of another girl who was obviously interested in him, and she said to him, Niente ricordi, uh, Franco, niente ricordi, no souvenirs. What she meant was, uh, I think she then pointed. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and to which Frank's response internally was, don't worry, <laughs> I know I'm not getting into any trouble like that. Thank you very much. Frank, in fact, was looked after by the entire village of Monte Benuti. He was, he, they built him a nice shack with a view um, and brought him food on a, on a sort of um, uh, rotational basis that the villagers themselves organised. Others lived within a family and became like a family member called the, the, the head man and woman, Mama and Babbo, um, and were treated like a son, uh, which also made it very hard for any of them to leave. The Italians didn't want them to go, uh, and uh, actually, the official figures show that about 2,000 are unaccounted for. 2,000 of the escapers are unaccounted for. Now, some of them may have died for a variety of reasons, but I'm quite sure, in fact, I know anecdotally, that there are some still living amongst us, or their children and grandchildren are living amongst us. They just merged into the countryside where they've been staying with their Italian family uh, for all that time. Frank did leave uh, and actually um, ended up being recaptured and went off to Germany and had a very bad time in Germany. Um, uh, but the bonds that were formed uh, remained and remained his entire life, as did, it did for many, many of the, uh, of the escapers of all nationalities. Um, uh, my friend Samar Salvi, whose Indian father, uh, grandfather, Ranjandra, was looked after by the uh, by the villagers in San Se Villa San Sebastiano down in um, Arezzo. Samar came back in 2010 and put up a truck to the people who looked after his um, his grandfather, and it ends end saying something like, uh, "Without your courage and compassion, none of us would have existed," and that is uh, that is repeated throughout every descendant of of the uh, Allied escapers had the same reaction. Without the help of the Italians, mostly of the Contadini, not always, there were others as well, but mostly of the Contadini, they, would not, they, they wouldn't have survived and their children would never have been born. As I say, Frank uh, came back regularly every year, right up until his death. Um, and this is the um, re restaurant in Montebeniki where he held his 50th wedding anniversary. It's still there, apparently. There also, the castle is a very smart hotel now. Uh, and that's really the end of the story. Uh, as I say, there's Frank in his old age. Um, this, is a, uh, this is Keith Kirby on the, on the other side, who was our, the founder of the Monte San Martino Trust. He was probably the only conscientious, conscientious objector ever to serve in the um, SAS. Uh, and uh, he founded the trust 
and named after Monte San Martino, which is a, uh, where he was first given succor over again in the Marque, um, uh, and of which uh, both Ian and I are trustees. And um, Simon's already explained the sort of work that we do. Anybody who's interested in becoming a supporter, it doesn't cost you anything, just go to the website, say you're interested, and we will then get lots of emails on Facebook. Um, and there is my book that I, I have given you an only really a little sort of Tuscan view of what went on. My book, of course, covers, covers a much wider group of people going from all the way up to very north of Italy, where people stay for up to 18 months because it took that long for the Allies to finally liberate the Venice and places like that. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to my colleague and uh, trustee, Ian, Ian Lang, um, who actually did have, uh, well, his father did have actual Florentines looking after him. What more to do there? Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I'm just a personal coder. Anne's the star this evening. And you've heard an uh, overview of the vast numbers of people who were uh, saved and sheltered in that era, of whom my father was one. And this coda, I've decided to make very personal and about Florence. And the key will be, during this talk, as to why we're both here tonight. Um, and it, I've gone to the family album, basically, uh, because, and I've called the talk Prince and Family, because at a personal level, you've heard of Frank's journey. And this is a few snapshots from my father's, which was pretty remarkable. And those who helped him, and others who I've been involved with. Um, and it's my sort of tribute to them. And I hope it resonates with those of you who live and love Florence, as all of us who come into contact do. So here is one of my greatest friends, personal friends, not a family member. His name is Vanny Treves. And part, there's a slight detective element in here, because it's about an Anglo-Italian love story. And so you have to guess with each of these characters, Where's the Anglo and where's the Italian? So I suppose with Vanny, the name is the name is probably the clue, clue. Because he's sitting here in the garden of Lang House in London. Uh, but he was born here in 1940 in Florence. His father was a professor at the University of Florence and was at the time. Italy's greatest living academic expert on Lytton Strachey and the Bloomsbury set. His mother was also Italian. His father was a member of the Partisans and was killed by the Germans. So his mother was widowed with a four year old child by the time the Allied armies liberated um, Florence. And um, thankfully, uh, an Allied officer, an English officer, fell in love with his widowed mother. And so Vanny was scooped up in 1945, brought to England as a five-year-old, and was himself brilliant academically. Um, he was ahead of me at Oxford. He went, went on, had a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, to University of Chicago, became one of the leading lawyers of the city, chairman of the oldest insurance company in London, chairman of endless other companies, of London Business School, where we spent an enormous amount of time together building it up, and was an altogether good egg, including raising millions and millions for all sorts of charities. The NSPCC was very close to his heart, and towards the end of his life, and um, I understood why, 
Um, but so was, so was our little trust. And he raised a million pounds for it to help endow the scholarships that we give to bring us the children and now the grandchildren of those Contadini and other Italians who helped us, helped our fathers uh, when they're on the run in Italy. So that's a, that's a story with Italian roots and it ends up very much in London, a supremely urbane, humorous, wonderful character. And he's got that sort of Italian physiognomy still, hasn't he? Um, Lorenzo Gallorini, of whom I don't have a picture, is an 18-year-old from Monospatoli, excuse my pronunciation. And he em is emblematic of the link that started a year ago when I came to see Sun. A year and year and a fortnight ago, I think it was. And um, he is a member of your Advantage English program here in Florence, uh, which I was immensely impressed by. And our family is, is, um, has funded a prize or a bursary in Vanny's honor, as a token of our friendship. And he is the first recipient of it. And he at the moment is over in Wimbledon for four weeks learning English. He comes from a quite a modest, as we say with an understatement, uh, English understatement, very modest family background. But this is his, we hope, part of a leg up in life to give him a better understanding of English that will hopefully, um, hope, hopefully help him in later years of his career. And he's actually, out of that meeting with Simon just over a year ago, we now have a really flourishing collaboration led by Amanda from your end. Where are you, Amanda? You know everybody here, who's been absolutely fantastic and is so appreciated by all our volunteer colleagues at our end. And it's a really deep co collaboration. Because I came over and I talked, I understood you had three different levels of English schools and all the rest of it. I said, well, why don't we just start gently? We have one from each of those three streams. Not by February this year. Amanda had generated 26 fantastic applications. And they're also good. We ended up giving them five bursaries. And we really do encourage you, Amanda, and your other colleagues, please. It's just fantastic because we have now plenty of children and now grandchildren from Emilia Romana, from the Marche, and further down the Abruzzi none from Florence. Um, and it's just wonderful to feel this. And these are guaranteed for the next three to five years, and they will be permanently endowed thereafter. I'm quite sure. Wonderful link. So here's another Anglo-Italian looking couple, wouldn't you say? Back in the 50s, who are they? Forget which church that is. There's a young bride, very young man over here, he's a teenager. It's my father. And he's as tall as I am, which is six foot three. And he spent the best part of three months here in Florence in 1943 and early 44 um, behind German lines. He was saved countless times in his work as a liaison with the partisan groups here. Um, and the, particularly the two families that I'd like to give you very specific examples of their courage. Um, the first is Paolo, the, the Booty family, his, his house in Via Cera Menotti, number eight. I remember well, from about 10 years old. 
she was absolutely fantastic because she was the only person we ever met in Italy who was clearly Italian, but spoke absolutely perfect English. And the reason was she was born in England of Italian parents. Her husband was also an Italian and he ran a very respectable business in Manchester. Um, very efficiently. And for his troubles, he was um, interned by the British as an enemy. <laughs> Anne was on her own here with her, their son and daughter. And um, she put up my father when he first arrived at considerable risk. She had some German cousins who turned up, I think, on Christmas Eve. Um, and luckily, my father was a very good linguist, so they just spoke German the whole of Christmas Eve supper. And nothing apparently awry. Um, and, but he thought it was a bit tough on her, and others were finding their way to her. Uh, and she was incredibly dangerous position and was eventually betrayed by a neighbor. She and her son, who was a teenage son, were both imprisoned in separate prisons. Their young daughter, Toy, I remember well. Uh, she was Professor Toy Bunty at Bologna University and, and said so I've completely lost touch with her. Luckily, Pam and her son, Kim, were separately freed from the jails here that they were in in Florence by the partisan groups. And, but my father felt incredibly resentful that their courage was not better recognized. And um, forever afterwards had a very, um, very wary, leery suspicion of the British honor system, because he tried for years to get her one, but to no avail. Um, what about this group? Well, you may recognize my father and mother there. This is in the basement in France in 1962. The person on the right is my great uncle, Sir William Wilkinson Wood, who was a Sheffield Steel tycoon. Most of the way down the left hand side, last but one is my grandmother, and the rest of them are the Tarkiani family, who are completely legendary within the Lang family, because they were the ones. Leopold on the left was a silk merchant. They had been here long established as a silk family. And he was a very, very um, anti fascist, anti Mussolini, strongly. Not, um, not uncommon here. And was an incredible protector of my father. And I'll give you a couple of examples. My father loved music. And so they would go weekly to the opera here. And very quickly, my father realized the best place to meet the partisan groups during the week when they came down to the hills was at the opera house. And so on a Tuesday night, he would put the box next door to the Gestapo box, because he also realized the Gestapo would burn Trump before the performance even began. So it's the last place they'd be looking kind of. And they, they'd be for us to arrive after the curtain went up and to be gone in the wedding before the end of the last act. And that routine endured, I think, for about eight weeks without anybody discovering it. But unfortunately, the inevitable happened. And on the right of this photograph, you'll see a very handsome lady who is Maria Grazia Tatiani. And when my father had to get out of France, she was nine months old. And they gave the Tatiani family, gave him a bicycle, and put Maria Grazia on the handlebars as his cover. How about that? And he bicycled out through all the German checkpoints. They had a house in the hills, 
beyond few years ago. They left it with the house, left it with the housekeeper. They had to be picked up later. And ran, ran, ran. So there, there's 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 a few stories from the family album. And like Anne's, they're very rooted here in Florence. And I just like to leave you that question now. Uh, both my parents are dead. My mother died 102 in 2019, just before COVID. But sadly, we've lost touch with both families. Uh, I'm quite sure the Tarkianas are still here. I remember visiting them. I remember Maria Grazia's wonderful apartment. She married, married a film director here. So if all of you can help re-establish contact with the two families, we'd A, love to see them, and B, we'd love their grandchildren to come to those students in English, because that's how we think. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ian, for that very personal illustration of the, the, the bigger story. Um, I'm looking at Amanda now. Amanda, we've got a project on here. We've got to find Takiani and Butia um, and somehow, you know, <laughs> the scholarship's waiting for them, so it's <laughs> an incentive. Um, but we'll do that. Uh, just to fill in a little bit of detail, which some of you in the audience won't be familiar with, the Advantage English program that Ian was referring to is an initiative of, of our English language school over at Viale Mazzini, which is headed up by Amanda. Um, and it's been it's just now in its third year just starting. Uh, and it's a program which has been very generously funded by uh, Paul Brown's foundation, many of you know Paul, um, to establish an opportunity for people in Florence, young, pe young people in Florence from the less advantaged communities to get the opportunity to study uh, English with the British Institute of Florence, which is by far the best in town. Um, and it's done in collaboration with the Comune who have helped us to navigate it. So it's a, an important program for the British Institute, giving back to Florence and enabling uh, the benefit of learning English, which can change your life. If you speak English, your employability goes to, through the roof. Um, so it, it, thanks to Paul Brown, and I don't think he's here tonight, but in our sense uh, for that. And also uh, it's lovely that we've con managed to combine it with the uh, partnership with the Monte San Martino uh, Trust to get one of the French English kids a scholarship this year, last year. So that's a bit of detail to explain that reference that Ian made. Okay, so as always, um, we'll now move to the question and answers bit, where um, feel free to uh, put your hand up if you're in the room, and I'll bring you the microphone so you can ask uh, Anne or Ian a question or make a comment. Uh, as always, on the Zoom, if you're there, um, you can put something on the chat, and I'll read it out for you. Um, or if you're feeling really brave, you can unmute and talk to us, and we'll hear you in the room. Um, so, does anyone want to get started um, with any thoughts? Right, but can, can you do the microphone instead of Zoom? I would like to know the, uh, where the title of your book comes from. Ah, well, you'll have to buy the book to read the, read the story. Okay. Uh, all I will say is that um, the girl with the peach is a symbol of the compassion that is always there, even in the most uh, appalling circumstances. Okay. Um, uh, and so a lady called Anna Kay on the Zoom has put up the question which I was going to ask, which is, what, what was the core motivation people, for people to help the POWs? Was it humanistic compassion? I'm, I'm really curious as to why the Contadini were in a sense were so enthusiastic to help these ragged, lost boys. Well, again, I have a chapter in my book called Motivations, which, which addresses some of that. I mean, bear in mind that, um, uh, the, uh, as I said, uh, uh, on the armistice, the Italians thought the war was over. Hooray. Um, and a lot of the contadini, of course, were, had no interest in anything outside their immediate environs, certainly weren't politically motivated in any way. Um, uh, and uh, I think it sounds corny, but the basic bedrock of, uh, of the help given by the Italians to the uh, escaping allies, allies was their common humanity. There were these ragged young men turned up on their doorstep, half starved, half dead, and they were taken in. Um, and a lot of these contadini, a lot of these Italians already had sons somewhere else, 
uh, prisoners or fighting somewhere else. So they, were, they became kind of um, uh, proxy sons, if you like, or actual sons, really, they were considered. Uh, so there are, other, there are other reasons. I think um, Ray Ellis particularly says that, well, you know, when we first arrived, uh, everybody thought the war was going to be over in, the, in a couple of weeks. So great, we'll take you in, have a big party. There were lots of big parties. Somebody describes them walk themselves walking through the Italian countryside, being like a glorified pub call because everywhere they stopped, somebody would offer them a glass of wine. Um, then, so then Ray, for instance, um, uh, was taken in by this family. Within two weeks, he'd become embedded in that family. They considered him part of the family, and there was no way they were going to let him go. Uh, so, uh, as I say, uh, the corny answer is common humanity. Can, can you move in front of the um, okay. camera then? Sure. Yeah, did you want to... Well, now I can see myself. It's horrible. I, I just wanted to add a little reinforcement to part of that answer, which is my father, my father never stopped saying that one, one, one of the great phrases that was always uh, given by hosts was, we have a son. Mm. He's on the Eastern Front. And we hope and expect someone is looking after him. Um, but it comes down to that core humanity. It's very beautiful, that. And it's also so striking that, for the most part, the Contadini, who had precious little to start with and were living a very difficult and challenged life, who were reaching out, whereas the Padroni and the fancy houses were more cautious and perhaps were fascists or whatever. There's a, sorry, and there's, um, I forgot, because I just remembered the story. There's a wonderful illustration of this. I think it's an officer who tells the story. Uh, that um, whenever he was stopping at a house, thinking of knocking on a door, he would check how many haystacks there were in the field. And if there were three haystacks, they were probably pretty rich. If they weren't fascist, they were, as modern parlance has it, fascist, fascist adjacent. Um, one haystack, and they were just too poor, they just wouldn't be able to give them anything. So on a sort of Goldie, Goldilocks principle, two haystacks <laughs> was the gold standard. I think I think that's that's a great summary of, of up in the hills of the Britsy. You ought to have seen the Takiani apartment here in the centre of Florence. They've been silk merchants for generations. They were rich, very rich, and many in Florence were doing it out of principle. It's a slightly different story, so it depends right where you landed. Um, as to and exactly what the motivation was. Um, Indeed, and I mean, it's a lot oh, of... Oh, 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 sorry, another very complex story, part of the story, which has not to go into probably yet, is the church. And the Institute of Priests was on the spectrum. Mm. That begins at that more and ends at the Some of them were quite extraordinary. Others were fascist informers. Mm. And um, but that's that's a deeper way I think. There's um sorry, just to finish that, um because I don't want to make it sound like I don't think didn't think any of the wealthier Italians did anything. They did. Um and Frank tells a wonderful story of a princess uh, living in a in a castle uh, near near to him. Who the local carabinieri, they would have to be told by the Germans if they were going to have a roundup. So as soon as the Germans told the carabinieri, the carabinieri would tell the princess, who then would send messages out to all the prisoners to scarper for a few days. And in fact, I'm sure you all know Iris Origo. So we got one here and then another here. Hi, I just wanted to thank you for putting such an interesting light on that part of history. My father, who was born in America, was a first-generation Italian, volunteered for the OSS in the Navy, and was assigned with three other men to be dropped behind the lines during the war before the Allies got there to bring the downed pilots from the north of Italy to Sicily. He tells very interesting stories about how the partisans snuck he and his men through and the, and the help that the Contadini gave him. I also wanted to say, um, I know several people, Georgiana Corsini, Principessa Corsini, who now calls herself, or who called herself, she's passed away, a contadini. And I know several other people who also 
well-educated also call themselves contadini. So I just am curious, is it still considered a bad thing to be called that? That's interesting because um, in the, it, it, that can have the same pejorative meaning as peasant can have in English. Um, it, it probably to a certain extent depends what you put in front of it. Um, uh, but also, um, uh, I, what I think is fascinating, a whole different story really, is the generational gap jump. So um, Giordano, who I was talking about, who found these photos, he's now a well-respected filmmaker. A few generations back, his family were illiterate peasants, uh, illiterate contadini. Um, uh, so there was a jump from the Middle Ages to the 21st century within maybe one or two generations, which is extraordinary. So thank you so much. But um, I think that the, these uh, contadini uh, helped, you know, allied soldiers also because most Italians hated the Germans. So they were actually on the allied side, allied side even though you know, before September 8th, 1943, we were allied with the Germans and the Japanese. But, you know, I think that most Italians didn't really <laughs> sort of support, you know, so they didn't actually support that, that, that alliance. So that's why they were so, so generous, and, you know, helpful with uh, the, the Americans and the and British, etc., etc., etc. Yes, although I have to say, again, in my book, there are several stories of uh, German deserters being looked after in exactly the same way. Um, uh, and there's some really extraordinary stories of German deserters being there at the celebration by the partisans of the liberation. Uh, so it's a bit more complicated than that. I mean, yes, they did. They were deserters, but they were also yeah, enemy deserters. Yes, they were deserters, that's right. Yes, yes. Not the deserters, you're right. Also, they hated the fascists. And in fact, the fascists were more dangerous because they were local. They knew where everybody was. And it's very bizarre that there were there could be 10, 15 uh, prisoners hiding in a tiny little village. Everybody knew that. Um, and, and it was been described to me as a kind of a neighborhood camouflage. Uh, it's fascinating. It's, it's, it's the sort of... It's the common humanity under the appalling situation of a disintegrating war, and people get above that. You know, I'm supposed to hate you because you're German. No, well, you're a lost boy. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. More, more uh, thoughts and questions from the room. I, um, I, I, I was listening to um, Jan's comment on Georgiana Corsini. Um, I, I know quite well uh, another ancient Florentine family who operate from a castle out in the country and make wine. Um, and the, the, the old guy there, the Con Conte, personally remembers when the Germans arrived at their castle, mm -hmm. German officers, and how they had to play this um, difficult thing of welcoming them and be nice to them, whilst at the same time... Hiding um, hiding people up in the attic. They, well, they were hiding art more than... <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but, and, and then moving... Um, uh, kind of semi interned in Palazzo Pitti whilst the uh, liberation was happening. It's an extraordinary story going on. Yeah. Anyhow, um, any more for any more? Anything on the Zoom? Zoom, as I note that Sarah's put her weekly reminder for your voluntary donations on the Just Giving sign. Always welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're moving towards the end. Um, Zoom is still, after all these years, haven't figured out virtual wine, so have one on us in your kitchen or <laughs> living room. Um, the people in the room are going to have the last evening of Rufino tonight, some nice um, uh, Acqua di Vene and some good, very good red wine, so that's waiting for us. Um, and then moment going to thank our speakers, but first, thanks to Barbara again, Barbara Hollowell, who is around somewhere, thank you for sponsoring this week. Um, and a huge thanks to Anne and Ian for sharing their stories, and strongly recommend the book, <laughs> which is on sale. <laughs> An annual sign. Yes, I know. I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book. I read it over the summer. It's fun. All right. And so, uh, uh, books and signing and wine through in, in the other room. And thanks, everybody. See you again next week. Bye. Thanks.